Anjana Shalakaya Chaksuru Meditam Dena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Ma Um Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamani Namaste Sharashati Deve Gauravani Pachadine Nirvise Shishini Vadi Paschatya Dasatani Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nityananda Shaddai Tagadhar Shivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda so today I decided I would go outside my house. This is going to be the last, well today and tomorrow will be the last time I will be at my house until probably next April or later or maybe not for another year and um, I thought I'd come outside you can uh, maybe hear the birds in the background and uh, it's a nice environment for me to give class and maybe someday you'll come here and you can sit I have this big yard it's actually five acres quite a big yard. There's five acres. There's 600 feet in one direction and 300 feet. In, so it's two football fields long and one football field wide. And that's, if you ask why we have so much land, um, that amount of land doesn't cost any more than, it costs about the same as a little plot of land in a nice neighborhood. But in the country, they don't allow you to build on less than five acres. So we had to buy five acres, which we got from our neighbor, who is an old friend of ours. So we ended up with five acres. We could do a lot of farming. We're not farmers, but we think about it. You could have a lot of cows. You could do so many things. You have a lot of people living here. So we are going to continue our discussion on prayer and what are the things that comes up all the time when we're discussing prayer well let me, let me put I always have to put the title in before I begin I think this is I think this is class number six So then I will go to chat if you have any questions or comments. So one of the um, things that comes up, excuse me if I have to scratch a lot, there may be bugs attacking me. This is the summer in Florida. And uh, yeah, we have to watch out. So when when we talk about prayer, what we're talking about is Praying for pure devotion, that, that is the essence of prayer, how to become a pure devotee, is the essence of Krishna consciousness, it's the essence of what Prabhupada taught us. Therefore, the essence of prayer is how to beg Krishna, ask Krishna, plead to Krishna, demand Krishna that we become pure devotees. So, understanding that as the basic foundation or basic premise for prayer. The prayer is meant to fulfill our innermost desire and our innermost desire is to become a pure devotee. Even if it's not our innermost desire at this point, it, in, we understand it is, even if we don't feel it as our innermost desire or we think my innermost desire is something else, we understand it is our innermost desire. That in a purified state, that's all we'd want, right? We'd only want pure devotional service. So, therefore, that's what we want to pray for, right? We want to pray for pure devotional service because that's, that's the whole aim of bhakti. That is what Prabhupada came to give us. Everywhere in his books, he's aiming to teach us pure devotional service. Srimad Bhagavatam, right from the beginning, it is meant for, it is said this book is about pure devotional service. It's meant for pure devotees. And Nectar of Instruction teaches us 
that the essence is to serve Krishna purely. Now, I've talked about this before, but I don't know if you've all heard it, and even if you have, it's good to remind you that we've talked about what is pure devotional service, and I think we should talk about it now because we're talking about prayer and we're talking about praying for pure devotional service. So, the definition of pure devotional service that we follow is given in the nectar of devotion. Anya abhilashitam shunyam. Anya means others. Abhilashita means with a motive of any, of a desire. To have. Anya abhilashita, anya abhilash, anya means others. Abhilash means desire. And ta means not desire, but the motive, with a motive to, a motive. So there's a difference between desire and a motive. Let's say I desire something which is not Krishna conscious. And I understand it's wrong. And then I engage in service. And my motive in serving is to overcome that desire or not be motivated by that desire. Or my motive in serving is to at least desire to please Krishna and to do something favorable for his pleasure. That even though I have so many desires, anya bilas, many other desires, abilashita, with the word ta, it means don't serve with the motive of those other desires. So I may have other desires, but I shouldn't serve, when I, I serve without a motive to fulfill those other desires or, about, or without being impelled by those desires. For example, sometimes I might serve because I want honor. And I might recognize that I may get honor, and then I realize that that shouldn't be my motive. It's so even though I have a desire as a conditioned soul to want to be honored, then I understand I, if I'm to do this service in pure devotional service, then I should do it without the motive of being honored. So then I kind of recollect my consciousness, focus it, tell myself, you just do this service for the pleasure of Guru and Krishna. That's all. Then I do it. But it doesn't mean I don't have the desire to be honored. If I'm honored, I would appreciate it. But what it means is that I'm not doing the service with a motive to get it. So if I don't get the honor, I'm fine because I didn't do it with that motive, even though I like to be honored. So you see the difference between the motive and the desire. I may like to be honored, but I'm not going to do the service with the motive to be honored. So anyabhi lashita means without being covered by the desire. And then it explains what these desires are in, in technical terms, according to philosophical terms. They're called jnana, which is the desire for liberation. Karma, the desire for material benefit, which will include all material benefits and specifically within Vedic terms, elevation to higher planets, which is actually the highest form of sense gratification in the material world, because on this planet you can only get so much sense gratification. So those who understand the Vedas, or you could say the smarter ones, they're not just interested in accumulation here, they're inter interested in doing pious activity so they can take a birth on a higher planet. Because here, you know, as high as you go here is like Beverly Hills or Bel Air. I don't know. I'm from Los Angeles, so above Beverly Hills is Bel Air. It's even nicer. Or I don't know, some Monte Carlo or some great place in the world which is considered fantastic but that's limited to this planet so so karma can mean fulfillment of any material desire and including within the vedic concept the worship of the demigods who can better fulfill our desires than we can and with the intention of performing pious activities so I can elevate myself to a higher birth and enjoy greater sense gratification. That's jnana, karma. So, jnana means, uh, jnana can also mean application of any form of spirituality for personal benefit, particularly, particularly what it refers to is I perform spiritual life so that I can become free from repeated birth and death. So the motive is to become free from the miseries that I experience in this world. So it's not a, a motive of pure love, it's a motive to become free from suffering, 
or it may be a motive to enjoy spiritual bliss as in merging in Brahman or or it may be um, yeah well, that's, that's most common it's most common here in the Western world the most common thing is you perform spiritual activity to not only become free from suffering but to experience bliss to be happy to feel peaceful so that's kind of jnana it's an impurity or it may even come just as just to know just to have knowledge for the sake of intellectual gratification I mean there there are subtleties it, it and then you have yoga which is to achieve mystic perfection or even to realize Paramatma but not to serve him but to begin to enjoy the pleasure of spiritual realization so you might say it's better but it's considered an impurity and if if you look at let's say you look at an ordinary relationship and in an ordinary relationship sometimes we have difficulty with people um, they do something unexpected if they're I'm thinking of a friend or a lover and they do something which is not indicative of what a friend or a lover would do and we say you know they promised me they were going to do this and then they didn't show up or they did but they were on the phone the time and they were neglecting me and I really needed to talk to them but they weren't listening to me and they were just trying to talk to me something like that so you would see it as, as you could call an impurity or just some kind of inebriety in the relationship so if you look at pure friendship pure you know what you would define pure friendship pure love pure relationship between mother and father father and son father and daughter you, you know we have certain standards which we would consider to manifest love or affection or friendship or devotion or even if it's someone is even if someone is a servant you hire them you expect certain behaviors so if we say that the desire to be liberated is an impurity you might think well that's a pretty high desire and Prabhupada recognizes yeah it's a higher desire than the desire to enjoy the material world but when you're talking about pure devotional service it's an impurity because it's still a desire that's more personally motivated I want to be liberated or I want to be free from suffering or even the yogis I want to realize Paramatma I want to achieve mystic power so even though they're doing austerity even though they may even be chanting what what they're doing is good but why they're doing it is impure so the definition of pure devotional service is that the motives will be pure not just the action not, not, this is not just that you do the proper action but the motives should be pure that makes sense so so I wanted to read a few things elaborate on this because I think it's it's really important to understand this because this as I said it's the essence of prayer but it's also the essence of pure devotional service and everything Prabhupada's teaching is meant to bring us to this position where we serve Krishna purely where we serve the spiritual master purely and again it's important to emphasize that I may be impure but I can still serve purely so we make a distinction and there's a verse there's some verses like that that will create this distinction um, I'll read I'll read a verse it's a very very interesting verse I've, I've read this before in many devotees are very fond of this verse I, excuse me I have to find it It's a, um, it's a verse about a devotee who is not pure but he is praying to act purely somehow or other I didn't wow that verse has disappeared hold on a second I thought I knew exactly where it was. Sometimes verses they they evaporate off the page, don't they? You think you know where they are, and they evaporate off the page. 
Hmm. Don't go anywhere. We might find it. Oh yeah, here it is. It was one page before where I had put the bookmark and I was turning the bookmark. I was turning from the bookmark, so I had to confuse myself. By my previous shameful life, my heart is polluted with many illusory attachments. Personally, I have no power to stop them. So, the devotee here is saying, past conditioning, past lives, now I've taken up Krishna consciousness, and what do I find in my heart? I find it's polluted with many desires. And I don't have the power to stop them. He, he doesn't mean that he's acting on them. What he means is that these are conditioned desires which will become purified by devotional service. As I have the power not to act on them, but I don't have the power to stop them from coming up. So there's a difference here, and this is the essential point we want to make. Sometimes you feel like you, you have desires and you don't have the power to stop them. And that's what he's saying. Because they're conditioned and they're symptomatic of our condition, that we will have these certain desires in our conditioned state. And so the devotee's acknowledging and accepting that he can't stop them in and, on, in, and, in and of his own accord. You can stop them ultimately by practicing Krishna consciousness, but he's saying, I can't stop them now, they're coming. And you'll see from reading further, but he's not saying I can't stop acting on them, so there's a difference. You know, like, I may have so many desires, and these desires I've, are leftovers from my past lives and past conditioning. But acting on them and having them are two different things. So listen to what he says. I'll read it again. By my previous shameful life, my heart is polluted with many illusory attachments. Personally, I have, I have no power to stop them. Only Lord Krishna within my heart can remove such inauspicious contamination. So only by the process of devotional service can they be removed, and they will only be removed by Krishna from within my heart. And that's Prabhupada explains in Bhagavatam. Suritsatam, Krishna is the friend of the devotees who cleanses vidunoti suritsatam from within the heart. So it's only Krishna that's going to purify us. But it doesn't mean we don't have anything to do with it. We execute devotional service and the purifying effect of the devotional service purifies us. So what do we have to do with it? We have to do with the uh, endeavor, the execution. But it's Krishna that purifies it. So that's what he's saying. Only Lord Krishna within my heart can remove such inauspicious contamination. But whether the Lord removes such attachments immediately or lets me go on being afflicted by them, I will never give up my devotional service to him. So he's making that point that I was just making. So he, he's saying, I have these attachments, I have these desires, and on my own, I can't get rid of them. But it's Krishna who will get rid of them. And as I said, Krishna will get rid of them through the practice of pure devotional service. So he's saying whether Krishna gets rid of them now or gets rid of them later, um, I will never give up devotional service. So, so he's making a very important point, and I've made this before. But I don't think we could make this enough. He's saying whether or not the desires are there, I won't give up my devotional service. That means I will serve Krishna. And what he's saying, I will serve Krishna without being influenced by those desires. I will serve Krishna purely. And what purely, this, you can say this is not pure devotional service because he's not executing devotional service from a state of purity. He's not on the stage of anartha nivritti. He's saying, I'm not on the stage of anartha nivritti. I'm on the stage of desires are influencing me. But, I, but he's, he's saying, I am on the stage of Bhajana Kriya, and on the stage of Bhajana Kriya, that's, you could say Bhajana Kriya and Artha Nirvriti, but for the sake of this discussion, let's use the statement of Bhajana Kriya. Bhajana Kriya means the practice. When you take initiation, you, you vow to follow principles. So that's the practice of Bhajana Kriya. So he's saying, for the sake of this discussion, I'll translate it. I'm not on the platform of Anartha and Nivriti. Anartha means unwanted desires, and Nivriti, Nivriti means the end, or the end of the power of those desires, or the, the frequency, um, the powerful control of those desires. I may not be free from those desires, but I'm going to engage in devotional service. So he's saying, in spite of those desires, I'm going to engage in devotional service. 
right? Yes? I'm listening to the sounds out here, trying to figure out what it is. It might be the filter from the pool next door. I always hear sounds because when I edit these recordings, I have to get rid of the sounds in the back. Anyway, so let's read it again. But whether the Lord removes such attachments immediately or lets me go on being afflicted by them, I will never give up my devotional service. Even if the Lord places millions of obstacles in my path, and even if because of my offenses I go to hell, I will never for a moment stop serving Lord Krishna. And this is really interesting. I made this point before, and it's one of the most interesting points of our philosophy and I think one of the most helpful, if not the most helpful, because it's foundational to so many dilemmas we have. Because when we become devotees, we bring our conditioning and we're well aware of our conditioning because we're trying to be pure. And when you're trying to be pure, you become well aware of your impurities, right? So the more you engage in devotional service, the more you become aware of your impurities. So here are the devotees saying, I'm well aware of my impurities. But simultaneously, he's making another statement. He's saying, okay, here's my stock of impurities, and I don't know when they're going to go away, because all I can do is execute devotional service and wait for Krishna to purify me, because I can't just go in and pull them out. But what I can do is not act upon them. And then he's saying, no matter what impurities I have, and no matter how much I'm affected by them, I will not act on them. Which is very, very interesting. In other words, the desire is there, but I've decided not to act on it. I've decided, decided to serve Krishna. So then the devotee says, even if these desires remain, even if due to my offenses I go to hell, even if there's so many obstacles on my path, I won't give up service. In other words, in other words, there's nothing that's going to shake me from my devotional service. And so he's making, he's, he's distinguishing two things. One is his own determination and willingness to, to serve Krishna. And the other is the material desires that he can't throw off immediately because Krishna will throw them off as he advances. So as we advance through devotional service, we come to a Nartha Nivriti, which means the end of most of these gross material desires, or the end of gross material desire. Then we come to Nishta, which is steadiness, which means we're not being battled around by these desires. So you could say that he's actually reflecting the stage of Anartha Nirviti or Nishta, that no matter what these desires are, I will be steady. And then you come to the stage of Ruchi, and that's when these desires have no longer effect us, or very, very little effect. But prior to the stage of Ruchi, we're aware of these desires. And so what stage he's actually on that, that could be a philosophical discussion, but it's not really the point of, of this discussion. But the point is, he's making, he's making the point that I'm well aware of my material desires, and I have many of them. And even if I don't execute devotional service properly, and I take birth on the hellish planet, or um, because, of, because of the nature of my conditioning, there are so many obstacles that I have to face, I'll never give up devotional service. So he's He's separating himself from the obstacle and saying, I know I have the obstacles, I know I have the material desires, but I want to engage in pure devotional service. And pure devotional service means I will serve Krishna to please him. Without the desire to, in, to gain material enjoyment, or without the desire to gain anything which is independent of service to Krishna, without the desire to be liberated from this world, liberated from suffering, without the desire to enjoy spiritual bliss. I just want to serve Krishna to please him. Just like when we serve our spiritual master, as Prabhupada said, we just want to see him smile. We want to serve him to know that he's happy, and that's our highest pleasure. So same way we want to serve Krishna to know that he's happy. I may want so many things. I, want, I, want, I may want praise. I may want so many things. But ultimately, the, my motive to serve my guru is not to be praised by him. My motive is to please him, to know I pleased him. If I please him, I please Krishna. So our motive is to please Krishna. My motive in chanting, why do I chant? 
to become a pure devotee. That's the only reason. That's the, at least that's supposed to be. I'm not chanting for material benefits. I'm not interested in mental speculation and fruitive activities. Even if Lord Brahma personally comes before me offering such engagements, I will not even be slightly interested. So here's, here's a very interesting thing. He's beginning by saying, my heart is polluted with illusory attachments. So attachment means to the body, to the family. And attachment to the body would mean attachment to enjoying the body. Now he's saying something which appears completely contradictory. It's very interesting, isn't it? He's saying, due to my past shameful life, I have all these material attachments. Now he's saying, that even if Lord Brahma comes and offers me everything that I want, in other words, I have these attachments, I want to enjoy, I'm proud, I'm envious, I'm attached to wife, family, body, sense gratification. Now even if Lord Brahma comes to offer them to me, I won't take them. Isn't that interesting? So he's recognizing I'm attached, I have these desires, but if they come to me, I won't take them because I want to render pure devotional service. I, I want to render service without attachment to these desires. I don't want my service to be contaminated by my own desires so that I can, I can put these desires in the closet, so to speak, and say, okay, I have them, but they're going in the closet because I can't use them in Krishna consciousness. So even if Lord Brahma comes and gives me more of these desires, I'll just put them in the closet because they're of no use. Now, if I can use any of them in, in Krishna service, I'll take them out of the closet and use them. But as, as far as my sense gratification, I, I have no use for them. So even though I'm attached to them, I like all these things in the closet. If, like sometimes I joke with devotees. So they say, Would you, do you want to eat this or do you want to do this? And I say, well, if I wasn't a devotee, yes, I would. In other words, I'm saying, yes, I do want to eat it, or I do want to do this, but I'm a devotee. So it's not part of devotional service, so I'm not going to eat it or I'm not going to do it. You see? And I think that's a really good example to illustrate what we're talking about here. If you ever thought of something you would like to do, but it has no relation to Krishna, you can't justify it in Krishna consciousness, then you might think, yes, I'd like to do it, but I wouldn't like to do it because it's not going to benefit my devotional service. It's not going to be pleasing to Krishna or my spiritual master. So I'm not going to do it. So if you ever, if you ever think of something in that genre, then you could say, I, you know, I'd like to do this, but I'm a devotee, so I'm not going to do it. Or you could say, if I wasn't a devotee, I would do it but I'm a devotee, so I'm not going to do it. Isn't that interesting? You like that? So, I'm not interested in mental speculation and fruitive activities. Even if Lord Brahma personally comes before me offering such engagements, I will not be even slightly interested. So it's such a paradox, isn't it? He's saying, I'm full of material attachments, but if you, if you try to fulfill these desires, if you try to give me the things that I'm attached to, I won't be slightly interested. Why? Because I'm only interested in pure devotional service. I'm not interested in these desires. I have them, but I'm not interested in them. Interesting, isn't it? I have these, I, I recognize them. I'm full of attachments. I have so many things that I want, enjoy, I think about, but I'm not interested in them. Like, we, like I gave the example. You know, I love to be honored, but I'm not interested in doing devotional service to be honored, even though I love it. It's like, I, I love to eat wheat, and the doctor said, don't eat wheat. So even though I love to eat wheat, if you offer me wheat, I'll say, I'm not interested. Please don't offer me wheat. I'm not interested. I'm not saying I don't like it. I'm saying I'm not interested in it because my body doesn't like it. I like it. My stomach loves it, but my physical health doesn't love it. Does that make sense? So you can love something, you can love something at the same time not be interested in it. Yes, like you have brahmachari, a man who takes a vow for a period of years or in his entire life to remain single and celibate. So does it mean that he, he doesn't think women are attractive? 
in many cases he does. Does it, does it mean he wouldn't, doesn't have the desire to enjoy women? In many cases, it may mean he does, but he's not interested. Because he feels that I could better serve Krishna being single. And if he feels that he has the power to control himself, even though he has the desire to enjoy, if he feels that he has the power to control himself and that he would be better off in his spiritual life being single, then he could say something, no, yes, I, I would love to be enjoyed with a beautiful woman, but I'm not interested. So, you know, there's a part of me that loves it, but the, spirit, the, the physical part loves it or the mind loves it, but the soul doesn't. So the soul's not interested. So I'm now relating to my life from the position of soul. So as a soul, I say I'm not interested. As a body, I say I am interested. You see? So yes, give me wheat. I love it. Body loves it. As, as a, my intelligence says, no, this is not good. My, no, my stomach loves it. My body doesn't. Or my body loves something, but my soul doesn't. So that's what he's saying. I will not be even slightly interested. Although I am attached to material things, I can see very clearly that they lead to no good because they simply give me trouble and disturb my devotional service to the Lord. So I want to render pure devotional service, and I'm attached to all these things. And if I engage with the things that I'm attached to, and they can't be used in Krishna consciousness, then it's just detrimental to my devotional service. So he's saying, I'm attached to all these things, but it's not good for me, so I'm not going to do it. What does he say? And I can see clearly they lead to no good because they simply give me trouble and disturb, disturb my devotional service. Therefore, I sincerely repent my foolish attachments to so many material things, and I'm patiently awaiting Lord Krishna's mercy. So, this is really nice, and we can use this in prayer also. He's repenting. So he's, he's, he's repenting the fact that he has these attachments or repenting the fact that he's cultivated these attachments. Oh, I know what that sound is. It's my computer. Sorry I'm so sensitive to sound. <laughs> it's just that I have to deal with it when I, when I edit. I have to... My computer's been like... You know, when computers use a lot of processing power, they, the fans go on. Lately, the fans been going on a lot. It's not a good sign, is it? Somebody has to tell me what I need to do so my computer's not working so hard. It's just, it's not processing anything. It's just, word is open. And if the fan's going off, strange. Okay, I got the fan off. That was a major discovery. Okay, so... Um, so he's repenting. Okay. Due to my conditional life, I've forgotten Krishna for so many years, so many lifetimes. I've engaged in, in sense gratification for so many lifetimes. Right? And now the result of all this is I have, I have all these desires that are just bamboozling me, trapping me, pulling me. And I can see that if I try to fulfill these desires, it's just going to keep me entangled in the material world. It's, what does he say? Uh, they give me trouble and disturb my devotional service. Um, they lead to no good. That can be a line from the song. It leads to no good. It leads to no good. They simply give me trouble and disturb my devotional service. Therefore, I, I sincerely repent my foolish attachments to so many material things, and I am patiently awaiting Lord Krishna's mercy. So, if I engage in devotional service, if I tolerate my material desires, in this case, if I pray to Krishna, please give me pure devotional service, and I mean it, and I act that way, then I just await, I go on tolerating my material desires, putting them in the closet. Whenever they come, just put them in the closet. I engage in devotional service purely, and therefore, I can pray, I can always pray, Krishna, please allow me to engage in pure devotional service. Allow me to tolerate my material desires. And then I can just await Krishna's mercy. And one of the symptoms of surrender is that we have faith in Krishna's mercy will come. Now, recently I've been thinking about a big problem devotees face. It's the biggest problem. It's the sexual 
attachment, sexual desire. And it, it's, I, was, I was on the internet last night and I was reading uh, a website about, or reading, a, I just Googled um, controlling sex desire or something to that, just to see what, what the non-devotees say about it. Because I always find it interesting that sometimes the non-devotees are able to deal with problems that sometimes devotees are not able to deal with it. And I think, well, is, is there some insight they have or is it just that maybe something so obvious to us that we've taken, for, taken it for granted and we're neglecting it? Anyway, the site I went on, or it was just a discussion, bulletin board type discussion, um, it wasn't what I wanted, but it was interesting. And it was basically just ordinary people saying, I'm 22, I'm this old, and I can't control my sex desire, and I don't know what to do. Other people who are married or not married, I'm married and I want to have sex, my wife, you know, every day and my wife doesn't, or vice versa. Or I have a girlfriend and she doesn't want to have sex and I'm, you know, I have to have it, I can't control myself. So it was all about this, I can't control it, I can't control it. And everyone who has a body knows that sex desire can be very strong, especially when you're young. And the amazing thing is that Prabhupada got us to, to join the temple, move into temples and give it up, which is like inconceivable because it's, in a sense, inconceivable, inconceivable because it's such a strong bodily urge. And so, before I was reading this, I was thinking about this topic because many devotees write me and they're, you know, they're dealing with this problem. And it is a problem. It is, it is, it is difficult to control. And they're dealing with it either as single people who are initiated or want to, who want to be initiated or they're dealing with uh, a married person who uh, who's married to a, a woman or a man who is very strict sexually and they need it or vice versa or their uh, their spouse needs it and they don't but specifically we're talking about the ones who find it extremely difficult to control and then then you have the ones even devotees who say I can't control it and yesterday I was thinking that what what this I wasn't thinking of this verse, but it came up in this verse, and it comes up a lot in Prabhupada's teachings. And I was just I was just thinking of it in a particular context, like, and I can't remember the exact context I was thinking of it. And a lot of times we get realizations within a context, and they're more powerful when we remember the context. So I want to try to see if I can remember the context. But it was some. You, the con this thought came to me, which was just came out of the blue, and it was just, it, I just felt like when someone says I can't control it, it felt to me like, no, no, you can, you can do anything you want, like like you're powerful enough that if you set your mind to something, you can actually do it, and don't say you can't do it, because you can, because you have to have this amazing, amazing amount of conviction that you can do it and this, this die-hard determination, okay, I'm going to do this and I can do it. Because the idea that I can do it, is that, that resonates with devotional service, that by the power of bhakti I can do it, by the power of my own intention I can do it. And, and it, you know, the problem that many people have is it's this desire this, it's a, such a strong physical desire. It comes on, and then when that desire is there, then the person feels helpless, and they say, I can't control it. But actually, but actually, we can. We have this incredible power to control ourselves if we have this conviction that I'm going to do it. And really, that this conviction is coming out in this verse where this devotee is saying, okay, this is, I have these attachments and just a reality, but I'm not going to give in because if I give in, then it just leads to suffering. And, and, and before I've talked about this, this other idea, which is it's a very interesting idea, that, that these physical urges, the urge to eat, the urge to sleep, the urge to mate, the urge to defend, 
as long as you have a body, they're going to be there. And the sooner you control them, the happier you will be living in your body, because otherwise your body's just pulling you around. And the body will always pull you around, pull us around. That's, that's what it means to have a body. And if you're going to give into it, then you have to give into it in a way that's not detrimental to your bhakti. So when is sex desire going to leave your body? Never. So if you say, I can't control it, that means your whole life you're going to go being completely controlled by your sex desire. And you're not going to be happy. Nobody's happy being controlled, especially if you want to get initiated, especially if you want to be Krishna conscious. It's going to not make you happy. It's going to make you unhappy. So I'm not saying that everybody is, is, can be entirely celibate. Everybody can be brahmacharis and sannyasis. Or everyone can be perfectly celibate even after they're married. But what I'm saying is, you can control it a lot more. If you're not controlling it well, you can control it a lot more than you think you can, but you're not, you don't believe that. You're not convicted of it. And therefore, you're not telling yourself, I can do it, I will do it. And once you say, I can do it, I will do it, you will start to see the power of your own conviction and the power of Krishna's help. And we talked about in other classes on prayer, that when you pray, it's best if you have that conviction, that faith. Okay, Even if you think, I can't do it, as we talked before, but that Krishna can do it. So your, your conviction is that if I'm, if I'm desirous of it, if I'm willing to let Krishna do it, he'll do it. In other words, there's some way that it'll happen, either through my own intense determination and willpower helped by Krishna, or the fact that I'm simply willing for it to happen, I'm desiring it, and I'm putting it in Krishna's hands because I'm not that strong. But if you have that faith that somehow Krishna can give me the strength and the determination and the willpower, then when you pray, it has power. But if you pray, you don't believe it, then it lacks the power. If you pray for something, but I don't really think, you know, okay, okay, I'll pray for it, but I don't believe it's going to happen. Yeah, 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 you say that, you can become free of these desires. Yeah, 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 I don't believe it. But anyway, you said to pray, so I'll pray. So what power will your prayer have? But your prayer, Krishna, I don't have the power, but I know you have the power. I know you can do it. Or Krishna, I don't have the determination, but I know you can give me the determination. I don't have the power to make this decision. I don't have the power to fight this force, but I know you can give me the power. You're within me. That kind of faith. Then you pray. Yeah, that's good. You, I hope you understand that your prayer has to be infused with that, with that kind of faith. Not that, yeah, yeah, I'll pray, but it's not going to work. Then, yeah, you're right, it won't work. And what Krishna is reciprocating with then would be your lack of faith. If you have faith in Krishna, he'll come to your rescue. Krishna, I have faith in you. I've given my life to you. I have faith that you can protect me from these material desires. I pray to you in faith. So it's kind of like there's two things going on. You're praying, but you have faith that your prayer will be answered. You have faith that Krishna can do what you pray for. And then here, this other aspect that, that's coming up is where the devotees re repenting, remorseful. Well, I, you know, I've all these material desires I have now were created by me. I cultivated them, and I feel bad about that. And I, I've said before, you know, when we look at our material desires, sometimes we curse them. That why do I have to have all these desires? It's just they get in the way of my devotional service. They're painful, as the verse says. They lead to suffering, but we're the ones who cultivated them. So. Now the devotee is remorseful that I've cultivated these desires. And I've not only cultivated them, but I've acted upon them. So it's good to feel remorse. So remorse strengthens our prayer. So if I'm praying to overcome something, it's also good within that prayer to offer some prayer of remorse. And I'm sorry that I've done it. Of course, I want to overcome this desire. And I've done it many times and I've given in to it and I feel bad and remorseful, and I want to, I really want to overcome it. 
to the degree that you want to overcome something, you'll be successful. So I believe that no matter how strong some desire is, no matter how much you think you're controlled by it, you can overcome it sufficiently. I mean, you know, physically, I can't overcome the desire to eat. I need to eat. And the sexual desire, because it's a physical thing, it's not that what I mean that the physical desire is going to go away. Although the more Krishna conscious you are, because your mind changes, it affects you physiologically. The desire will subside more. But for, for the sake of discussion, just saying the desire remains the same, but your ability to deal with the desire is going to change. Right? So even that same intensity of desire, but how you deal with it now, now you'll have more control of it. You'll be able to regulate it. You'll be able to tame it. You can do that. And if you say, I can't, then you, you can't do it because you don't believe you can. And because you don't believe you can, you're not going to try. If you're not going to try, then you're not going to get Krishna's help. And if you're not going to try, you're not going to pray for Krishna's help. But if you're willing to try, and if you believe that it can be done, then you can pray for it. You can actually pray for it, and you can actually endeavor for it, and you can actually do it. And I've seen it with so many devotees. And I was just thinking about this yesterday, because I was thinking in my own life of how I've, I've made determination to do certain things. And, and, and because I've made that determination deeply, then... I was able to follow through on it. I remember living in Vrindavan, and I, when living in Vrindavan, I made a determination because I'm living in Vrindavan to act a certain way. And even though I had desires to act another way, I wouldn't do it because I'm living in the Dham. And that chastened me, and I was able to follow through. And living in the Dham made me deeply commit. So even if you're not living in the Dham, if you deeply commit to something and you remind yourself, no, I, I can't do this, I've committed to it, I would like to do it. I feel like doing it. If I wasn't a devotee, I would do it. You could say, if I wasn't committed, I would do it. But you've, now you've committed. You understand? <clears throat> so, I would like you to just meditate on this. Meditate on the things you think that you just can't control. You know, every time I'm in this situation, I give in. Okay, I don't say the desire to give in is going to go away. Although it will go away in due course of time as you advance in Krishna consciousness. So we're dealing with two different issues. One is the desire going away. And that will go away as you advance in devotional service. So just by your steady daily sadhana, over the years you will see those desires will reduce slowly. Not necessarily all of a sudden, but slowly. But what we're dealing with here is the fact that the desire exists. And that you're saying, because the desire exists, I must act on it. And that's not true. Or because the desire exists, you say, I can't control myself when I, I fall for this. Now, um, there's a lot of women who, who write me who've, who've got into relationships with men and the relationship is not healthy either because of the man's fault or their fault or both of their faults. And usually in most of these letters, there's this theme where I made a mistake and I stayed in the relationship too long and it was unhealthy, but I stayed in it because I need, I need a relationship, I need a man. Okay, so you need a man, that means you're normal. You stayed in an unhealthy relationship means, nowadays, that means you're normal also, because many women do that. That's become quite normal. But for the sake of discussion, let's call that not normal. And most of the women realize, because the relationship was unhealthy, that they shouldn't have done it. But they, un they realize their weakness, you know, that they had a need to fulfill. And so the relationship was fulfilling part of that need. And because it, it was fulfilling part of that need, then that weakness overcame them. So in that situation, how do you deal with it? We go back to this point and say, okay, I realize I have this desire and I have this need, but I have to understand how to fulfill it in a healthy way, right? So the problem is when we give in to the desire in an unhealthy way, we say, I'm just weak, you know, when I'm in this situation, I give in. Okay, so that's, that's where that point has to come, where you understand that you can control that. You 
have the power to control it when you make the determination that I'm not going to do this because it's wrong, it's bad. When it becomes clear to you that I need to stop doing this because it is wrong, the results are detrimental, and if I don't stop, it's going to continue happening, and I'm going to fall in this trap again and again and again, whatever it might be. In this case, we're talking about a woman falling into a relationship with the wrong man, a man who is not either not really a man, can't, can't be there for her, cheats on her, um, what would be another example, doesn't listen to her, is very harsh. In some way, it's not really what a woman needs from a man, and she holds on to it because of a weakness, because of a need that that male energy fulfills, and so she's willing to tolerate mistreatment and let down, and you know, and then she becomes depressed and whatever. It's quite common. So, she has to have. She has to, to realize that I, if I'm involving myself in relationships like this, I'm just going to keep suffering. And a lot of women realize that they tend to fall into these relationships over and over again with the wrong kinds of men. So they have to realize I have this need that needs to be fulfilled, but I'm fulfilling it with the wrong kind of man, and I have to control myself, not to just be attracted to any kind of man, because the man happens to, to be around and I happen to get to know him. What I would advise is don't get to know him if him doesn't have the potential to be a he, in the full sense of a he, of a he-man. If he doesn't have the potential to be a he-man, or he's not, if you can understand, he's not really of the same nature or caliber, it wouldn't be good, then just don't get around it. Have the strength to say, that person is not the person I need to be near, and I can see if I'm near him, I'll become attracted to him. So I will stay at a distance. So you have to have that willpower, determination to do these things. And we can have them. And when you realize your weakness, that that's the thing you have to pray to Krishna for, strength to deal with. Krishna have this weakness. I, when I, get, I fall for these men who can't be good partners. It's my weakness for some reason. I'm, I, I need strength. And I'm no longer going to fall for these men, and I need you to help me. And if there is no such good men, then there'll be no man. It's not a bad man or no man. It's no man or no man. And when, when I hold out for the right man, then at least when he's there, I'll know he's there. We can do that, right? We, can, we, can, we take vows. That's what it means to take a vow. We take vows at initiation. And the vows have to go deep within the heart. And when we take a vow, we say, I am going to do this. And we can do this. Krishna has given us the power to do that. But when you do that, then you accompany that with prayer. And because you've combined your vow, your determination, that deep commitment that you've made, that I can do this, I will do this, as the devotee is saying in this verse, even if all these desires come, even if Brahma gives me he gives them to me, I'm not going to do anything. What else does he say? Um, if Brahma personally comes before me offering such engagements, I will not even slightly be interested. So even, you know, even that boy comes, no, not, or even that girl comes, no, because I can see that's the wrong one. And I've made determination now. And every day I pray to Krishna, you give me guidance and intelligence. So in this way, we, we connect our prayers to what we need, and the foundation of the prayer is pure devotional service. I serve Krishna purely to please Him, and I, and I, I want to serve and engage my life in a way in which I don't do anything which will be detrimental to my bhakti. So anything that I want, that I like, only can I use that if I can use that in Krishna's service in a way that's not going to harm me or degrade me. And if I can't use it that way, then I don't use it. That's just how it is. That's the way it has to be. I'm trying to think of practical, uh, more practical examples, because I think that's the best way to explain philosophy 
is to explain it in terms of practical examples that we can all relate to, of things that are, are very difficult to control. Or we'll say anger. Anger is something we all, we all deal with. We all get angry. We all get frustrated. We all sometimes lose control. Sometimes we say nasty things. Sometimes we criticize. We don't, and then we regret it. We don't mean to do it. Um, highly conditioned. And let's say you want to control your anger. And, and then you're feeling, no, I can't control my anger. No, you can. One of the things that I've realized is when you want to and you say, I can and I'm going to, then Krishna gives you all kinds of intelligence and, and ways of seeing the situation so you can do it. Ways that you never saw before, which made you think, I can't, because you never, you never saw a way out. When you, when you say, I can't, usually what you're saying is, I don't see the way out. And I get so many devotees writing me and saying, I, I can't see how to deal with this, or I can't see the way out of this. And a lot of times I feel that if they wanted to get out of it more, and they had the conviction they could, Krishna would help them see. And sometimes I'll just tell them a few things to kind of get them on that track, and then they'll write letters back and say, now I see that this was wrong, and now I see I should have done this, but I didn't do it, and Krishna is giving me the guidance and intelligence how to do it, and I met this other devotee, and we talked about this, and it's really helped me, and then I read this purport. Like everything just kind of fell into place. The purport showed up, the other devotees showed up, the intelligence showed up. So that's, that's the problem when we say, I can't, because when we say, I can't, everything kind of shows up to confirm that we can't. And I'm sure you've experienced that, isn't it? No, I can't do that. And it seems like Krishna says, okay, well, let's prove that to be true, that you can't. So when you say you can't, and then you try, and then you, you, you fail. You say, I told you I can't. And then it confirms that you can't. But your, your effort had a foundation of I can't, so therefore you failed. And therefore you believe that you can't. Whereas if the foundation is I can, then, you start, then Krishna starts to show you how you can. At least that's my experience. Krishna shows you how you can. Yes? You have that experience? Well, even if you don't have that experience, what I would say is experiment with it. Just say, okay, I'm going to do whatever that challenge is that you're dealing with. Just say, I'm not going to give into it anymore. Or I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then see what happens when you make that commitment. See how Krishna changes your consciousness. See what Krishna sensed you in form, in form of lectures, purports, sangha, people, discussions. See if Krishna doesn't help you deal with it. See, see if Krishna doesn't give you more clear intelligence how to deal with it, strength to deal with it. He will. And then pray for all those things also. So you have the faith that Krishna is going to give it, but then you pray for that. Krishna, please give me these things. So the faith and the prayer, when you mix it together, it has this synergistic effect and it's just really powerful. Does that make sense? Yes. So you can do much more than you think you can. So, um, yeah, okay. Why don't we stop? We've gone 50 some odd minutes. I think, yeah, I think I made it clear. I mean, I can repeat it again. Sometimes I like to repeat it because some things are subtle, you know, and you don't get them the first time. And a lot of things I'm explaining, I'm explaining from my own experience. And if you don't have the same experience, then you kind of have to adjust your thinking to be able to, to um, understand it. But, yes, we, we, all have, we all have our natures, but our nature is uh, our our nature sometimes could be whimsical and obviously that's not going to be good for krishna consciousness our nature maybe we we may be especially attached to something which isn't good for our krishna consciousness or we may be very whatever we are um, we don't think clearly like some people think very clearly maybe our nature is we don't think clearly and so Whatever that nature is, we don't want to allow that nature to control us. 
we recognize we have this nature and then we can pray to Krishna, please give me the intelligence to deal with these things. Right? Okay, Krishna, I'm whimsical. I make decisions at the spur of the moment however I feel at the moment. And that's not good for my bhakti. Please help me be guided more by intelligence. Or maybe I'm not grounded. I'm just like, you know, one day I'm up, one day I'm down. So I recognize that's my problem. So Krishna, please help me become balanced. Help me become grounded. And then we commit to that. I'm committed to being more grounded. I'm committed to in this other scenario, not being whimsical, but thinking things out more. Not acting spontaneously. When I feel like acting, I wait. I consider. I look at things from all perspectives because I tend to be whimsical. I'm very spontaneous. And I can get myself into trouble in my spontaneous. I just pick up and do something and go somewhere. And, or make decisions or just change my service like that. I'm very spontaneous. No. Krishna, please give me the, give me the ability to act more from my intelligence. You know. or one day I fall apart. I... I I lose it. Now, Krishna, give me the ability to be balanced, to be grounded, to be sober. I lack sobriety. Um, I see. Um, I see a lot of devotees have. Um, I don't think a lot of devotees, but some devotees have a nature where they're very condescending and condemning, and let's hear something and then. Oh, that's stupid. That devotee's stupid. That's not what Prabhupada said. It's just like it's, it's just their nature. It's just how they are. They just they just react, you know, immediately. They just react, and they could be very Krishna conscious also. But that's just their nature. They just hear something and just react. I don't even think it's just it's just like it hits them. It hits them as this is not Prabhupada, or this is, this is Ritvik, or this is that, or this is this. So if you have that nature that you want to pray to Krishna, please give me the ability to be able to consider things more soberly. Or give me the ability to be more sympathetic to other people's ideas. I'm not sympathetic to other people's ideas. When I'm convinced that something is a certain way, I can't hear anybody. So if you realize that's your nature, you don't think that that's just how I am, I can't overcome it. Work on it and think, no, I, I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to I'm going, to be, I'm going to consider, I'm going to work on considering other points of view because I don't do that enough. But then you connect your prayers to that. Krishna, please help me be able to see things from more various perspectives. Krishna, please, please help me be able to deal with difficulties when I become emotional. Please help me to not become controlled by my emotions, but to work through these things and, and act in a sober way and not say anything that I later regret. Things like that. Okay. We've gone over the hour mark. Two minutes past. Now. I will end here. And I'll ask... if You know, there's only three of you on chat. So if you want to ask a question, you go on to chat. Is the... Guru is there any like, trick to getting on the chat? Or is it just like you hit... What, you just have to look get a name and a password or log in and a password then you can go on to chat or if you're dying to ask something and you can't figure out how to get on to chat then you can Skype Guru Nishta and ask her the question um, the the I can't word has to you know the I can't word is um, you know let me explain things a little further because this could be misunderstood <coughs> Excuse me. We have a nature, and Varnashram talks about that nature, that you may have a nature to be Brahminical. And uh, you have a nature to be Brahminical. So I'm not saying that, that if you have that nature, you, should, you can say, <coughs> Excuse me. You deny that nature. But Let's say you have that Brahminical nature to such an extent that you can't even motivate yourself to get out of your desk, that you just read books all day. I mean, you say, well, I can't do anything but read. Um, 
that's not you know obviously you can do some you know you have to work you have to do so many things so i'm not saying to deny your nature but i'm saying when your nature becomes an impediment to your bhakti then that's what you can control i mean you you know if you say i can do anything and now now today you're trying to oh, i have trees here and they're about 30 feet high so i'm going to try to jump over those trees because mahatma said i can do anything so we're, we're not talking about things which go against natural physical laws and and you're you have a nature which also is who you are vaisha chatriya shudra whatever so that but we're talking about when that nature starts working against you when it's not controlled so maybe you're a business person that's your nature and you're very good at it and you know how to make money but that's all you do is make money and you give up your sadhana that's not good or you don't use that money in Krishna service so that's what you can control. So the things that you can control. Don't say, I can't con Don't ever say, I can't control what you can control. And don't say, you can control what you can't control, because that's also another problem. So I'm not saying that you can just control anything. You, you should know what you can control. But to say, I can't control what you can control, or to say, I can't control what I can control better than I'm controlling now, that's the problem, because when you say it, you empower your weakness. And we've talked about this before. Words are, words are very powerful. So if you can do something and you say you can't, you empower your weakness. This is how I am. I always get into trouble. Okay, this is how you are up to today. But what about from now forward? Do you want to be that way? No, I don't want to be that way. Okay, so now start thinking about how not to be that way start becoming more determined about not being that way or how being uh, how to be less of that way or how to use that way more in service if that's possible okay i can't stop eating sweets all right well how many sweets do you eat today i eat 10 how about going down to five next week two and a half the week after how about getting it down to one i know you can't stop how about getting it down i'm talking about per day not per week how about getting down to one sweet a week could you do that? Yeah, I probably could. If I'm really determined, I could. Now, you're not going to be determined to do it if you don't want to. Because if you're, if you're thinking, well, why would I want to do that? I love sweets. Then you'll fail. But like in this verse, the devotee says, because I could see what I'm doing leads to no good. So it has to be something that you look at and say, this is not good. It leads to no good. That's where the impetus will come to stop it. So you say, yeah. I'm eating sweets, not good for my health, and it just makes me tired, and I don't like it. So at that point, you could say, yeah, I can control it to a certain degree. I'm, I'm going to get it down, instead of five a day, I'll get it down to one a day. So I'm just trying to, you know, I don't want to be unrealistic about this. I'm just, I'm just saying we can be better. We can be a little better, particularly in areas where we say, I just can't control it. And I was, I was citing the example of sex desire because that's such a strong physical desire. It just physically, it just pushes so many people. And it doesn't push you physically, it pushes you emotionally and you become crazy. But if you're determined, you can control it. So I will direct it and utilize, sex desire can be utilized. I will control it and utilize it in a way that doesn't degrade me. So... Um, Okay, so, yes, okay, all right, so I think we're good. So we're going to uh, have class tomorrow, same time, and we'll see you all tomorrow because there are no questions. And uh, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, and excuse me, I'm allergic to grass, I think, and the grass was just cut. Okay, before I go, I'll give you a little view of my property. As I said, we have to buy five acres. So this is the backyard. This is our backyard. There are the trees I was going to jump over. Isn't that amazing? That's what I was looking at. I, was, I kept uh, looking away from the camera because I was just looking at what's the scenery out here. Next to us, there's devotees. I don't know if you can see their house. And they live on five acres. So together we have 10 acres. And then behind those trees back there, there's 10 acres. And then next door, 
over there you see trees, there's 10 acres. Then behind us there's 10 acres. And then behind that there's 10 acres. So there's, there's, um, and then next to us, um, over where those devotees, there's like 100 acres. So we're surrounded, we're like in an area of about 150 acres and um, I think there's seven houses. Kind of interesting. Anyway, this gives you an idea of what Alachua was like. And um, and the mortgage payments on five acres and a house um, are cheaper than a one a three hundred square foot one bedroom apartment in London because I was in a three hundred square foot one bedroom apartment in London in a basement near the Soho Temple, and I said, how much are you paying? And they said, 1,600 pounds, which is like $2,000. So this looks like big and expensive, but actually in a big city in America, you could only get like a one-bedroom apartment for what we pay. So, okay, we have a question here. Let's see if I can read it. Excuse me, I'm going to pull this closer. So it says, Hare Krishna. If you have time, quick question. Sometimes prayers can be unknowingly, selfishly motivated. How do we avoid that? Unknowingly, selfishly motivated. Well, I want to read something to you. Now that you brought this up, there was something I wanted to read, and you reminded me, and it's very interesting. And maybe it'll answer your question. This is from uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He says, In the course of performing devotional service, devotees may at times be placed in dangerous situations. They may have no other recourse than to pray. Quote, O oh Krishna, please save me. Unquote. This prayer does not express a desire to please Krishna but it is a desire integral to life, the survival, the survival instinct. Because such desires indirectly relate to serving Krishna, they do not disqualify a person from pure devotional service. Now, so, is it selfishly motivated, but, okay, so you could say, the, you know, you're in danger, and then you pray to be saved, or you pray for anything good to happen to you. But then, and then we can say, for the sake of this discussion, it's a selfish desire. I want something good to happen to me. Because Prabhupada said a pure devotee would not, like if someone who loves Krishna would never ask Krishna for anything. So then we understand that we're asking Krishna for something that it's not pure. All right, so we understand, okay, I'm not a pure devotee, so sometimes I may ask for something selfish. But the point is, will that help you in your Krishna consciousness? That's, that's the point that's being made. Okay, I'm praying, Krishna, save me. But if you save me, then I'll serve you. I can serve you. One devotee was, in a, he was having an operation, and he said that he prayed. He said, Krishna, if you save me, then I promise I'll dedicate my life to you. So if you say, if I have a body, I can serve you. So Krishna, please help the body. So if your selfish desire, your selfish desire has to be, connect, has to be connected in some way to Krishna. So just like you, you're a young woman. And most young women want to be married at some point in their life and would find that um, helpful or would find, let's say, difficult not to be married. And it would be better that you're married to a husband who's a good devotee and is a good person. So if you understand that and you pray, Krishna, please send me a husband who's a good devotee and a good person, uh, someone who can help me deal with my personal issues and be support for me, that's not entirely personal. It's say from the definition of pure devotional service, it's not... It's not entirely pure, but from the definition of where you stand, then to have those things would be helpful. So if the prayer is in relation to how it will help you, 
then it's okay. And then if you say, well, Krishna, if I have this, I think I can serve you better. Or I would like to start a preaching center, but I can't do it alone. If I were married, I could do it with my husband. You know, something that some kind of service you would like to do. Then the desire to have a nice husband, which you may look at as material, but in okay, for the sake of this discussion, we'll say, yes, it's a material desire. Then, but that's being employed as something that would be beneficial for your devotional service. But even looking at a husband as a <coughs> material desire, you, you know, let's look at it from Varnashram. It's, it's, it's an ashram, so it's just an ashram that you go through. So in that way, it, it's, I, I, don't see, I don't think we should see it as a material desire. You only think of it as a material desire if the goal of being married is sense gratification. If the goal of being married is to serve better, then it's not even really material. So you, you, you want to take some selfish desire and see how you can connect it in a way that you can serve Krishna. You know, it's, it's bhakti mixed with some karma. But... In the, nat- in, in the example of being married, being married is such a psychological, physical need. It's not like, I want to be a rock and roll star and do it for Krishna. We might say, better you don't do that, because it's not so good for you. It may be problematic, but to say, for a woman to say, don't get married, we would normally say, it's probably problematic if you don't get married. So you see the difference? It's, you know... That example is, you know, some examples of selfishness are not ideal. Is it selfish that I want to eat nice prasadam? No, because if you don't eat nice prasadam, you go crazy and then you can't do your service. So you don't, you know, it's not that everything has sour cream in it, but you want to eat prasadam that satisfies you. So we all accept that, that we should eat what's healthy, but what tastes good, and Prabhupada said that. So it's not really selfish in that sense, because it's, it's a need. It's a physical need that has to be fulfilled. So you, you want to understand the difference between selfish and just kind of normal, ordinary needs and, and things which are part of Krishna consciousness, like prasadam is part of Krishna consciousness, being married as an ashram, it's part of it. Okay, would it be better if I just eat fresh fruits and milk and that's all I eat? Okay, that, if you could do that, it would be better. Will it be better if I could be celibate? If you could do that, yeah, it would be simpler. It would be better. But if you have the need to eat nice things, then eat them. If you have the need to be married, then be married. Then do it in Krishna consciousness. So, um, examples, materially ex- uh, examples of things which um, are selfish. I want a nice house. Okay. What are you going to do with the house? Once you get the nice house, what are you going to do? Well, on Sunday, I think I'll sleep 12 hours. Okay, that's wrong. So, I'm going to get a nice house. What are you going to do with it? Well, when I have a nice house, then I'm going to do nice deity worship, and I'm going to have a lot, I'm going to have a lot of kids and make devotees because we have, the house is big. And I'm going to invite devotees over for kirtans and prasadam, and we'll do a bhakti riksha. Okay, so... I need a nice house because that's just what I need. Is that selfish? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I think sometimes what you have to realize is that some of the needs we have are so ingrained in who we are that we can't even separate ourselves from it. Just like some devotees, they need nice things. They They need to look at nice things. They need to wear nice clothes. They need their room to be painted a nice color. They need to have the curtains just, you know, right? Everything has to be beautiful. It's just who they are. And if it's not, they go crazy. If things are out of place, if there's a scratch on the desk, you know, which is why sometimes when Americans or Westerners, um, they can't live in India because things are too, they're too Indian. You know, they're not Western. They're, you know, they're, things are dirty. You know, you get things made, they don't make them right. And so some people have this need that everything's got to be so to be really, really fresh, clean, beautiful. That's just their nature. So then, then if, the, if they have a house with all these nice things, you say it's, for them, they don't even notice it. It's just, but they're good devotees. That's the thing, you know. They still get up early and chant their rounds. But they have this beautiful room, 
and they chant these amazing rounds because they have this beautiful room and altar, and that's what they need. So, in terms, of, it, you have to understand also what you mean by defining materialistic and selfish. But you know, a lot, a lot of times we say, "I need all these things, but I need them to do my devotional service." Oh, you have a MacBook Pro, the latest MacBook Pro. Well, I need that to do my service. You know, you might quite, would you really need a MacBook Pro? But well, I'm doing video editing, I'm doing audio editing, it's the best computer for it, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you need it. And, and plus, you like MacBook Pro, and you like fast computers, and if you didn't have a, a nice computer, you would go crazy. So you get a nice computer, and it's over, and it's finished, and you do your service, and it's not a problem. If you have 10 computers, and you're obsessed, yeah, that's a problem. Then it becomes a deviation. So some things, you have to realize, they may be selfish, but they may be so ingrained in our nature due to our conditioning that we don't see them as selfish. We just see them as, well, that's what I need. I need, this is how I need to eat. Or this is the kind of house I need. Or this is the kind of computer I need, or the kind of clothes I need, the kind of car I need. That's just, you know, but it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, I bought a BMW instead of a Ford, but that, doesn't mean, you know, so I spent $10,000 more, which only means I'm spending really $60 a month more in my monthly payments. So it's not really, I just need this car. I don't know, I need a comfortable car or whatever. You know. So you understand that some things are just ingrained in our nature, but they're not necessarily selfish. And then once we satisfy those needs, those needs are out of the way, and then we can just engage fully in Krishna consciousness. Okay, I ate this beautiful meal. Meal's over. Now I engage the rest of the day in devotional service. I slept in this nice room, but, you know, for 18 hours a day, I'm not in that room. But I need a nice room to sleep in, because if it's not nice, I won't sleep well. Okay, you know. Does that make sense? Or something to think about? Yeah. So I don't know what you're referring to as... Um, Um, unknowingly selfish prayers. Thank you very much. Yeah, I hope it answers. I don't know, if it didn't answer your question, completely ask more. Uh, see, the thing is, if, if your heart, that your motive is just to serve Krishna, then you may want certain things which for somebody else wouldn't would be considered selfish but for you it's just it's just what you need to get to zero and that's a good way of like everyone's getting to zero is different so what do you need to get to zero i need a bmw what do you need to get to zero i need a 1983 toyota uh, ford fiesta that's fine for me that gets me to zero as long as it gets me from point a to point b and doesn't break down more than three times a year, it's fine for me. And it's got a little rust on the back, it's okay. Someone else is like, no, you know, I, I know about cars, I grew up with cars, I fix cars, you know. I need a BMW, it's just what I need, you know. So I'm willing to work hard to get it. And, you know, and once I get it, that puts me at zero. And now I just, I don't think about it anymore, you know, you know. Uh, I'm always thinking about getting married. So I get married and I stop thinking about it. The brahmachari doesn't need to get married. He's not thinking about it. So he's already at zero. I get married and now I'm at zero. So we're both at zero now. I need the one-bedroom apartment, you know, that's very inexpensive. You need the four-bedroom house. You get the four-bedroom house, you're at zero. I get the one-bedroom apartment, I'm at zero. Now we're both at zero. Now we're both fully engaged in devotional service. So it's, it, it's what you need to get you to zero. There was a god brother of mine when he was, he was about 50, he had, he bought a bus and he converted that bus into um, a traveling temple and he converted the back room. He had an office and a bedroom. And one devotee said, why couldn't he just travel in a, a van? Like the Brahmacharis travel in a van, like four of them in a little van. And the devotee they asked, happened to be Tamal Krishnamaraj, he said, because he's 50 years old. So at 50, your point zero is different than what it is at 22. At 22, four, four of you living in a van, traveling for a month, taking showers out of a bucket, that's your zero. But when you're 50, then the mobile home with the actual shower and 
the kitchen and this and that, that's your zero. But 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 both of them are engaged. You know when, you know the 18 hours a day, 17 hours a day, they're both fully engaged. So what gets you to zero, so you can fully engage? That's what's important. And then that I don't consider that selfish. It's selfish in the sense, but selfish in the sense to get you to zero. And after zero, then you dedicate yourself fully to Krishna consciousness. So it's just like, we have this nice house. My wife grew up in a nice house. I grew up in a nice house. I'm a, I'm a little more simple, like um, a mud hut would be like great for me. Uh, well, actually, a few mud huts. One, one for my office, one for my bedroom, one for my wife, one for my dog. We could have a whole, you know, could look like the Flintstones and have our little caves, you know. That would be good for me. And in Mayapur, we have we have a house which is less than half the size of what we have here. And we're okay. We're fine. You know, she's fine. But she grew up in a nice house. So for her, a nice house, you know, we have a four-bedroom house. And you build a four-bedroom house in Alachuan, and, and it, as I was saying, it costs, you know, what you have to pay for a one, less than a one-bedroom apartment. And London. So, okay, for what we'd pay, you know, if we have to live in the city, we have a house here. Okay, and she wants this. Okay, so we build the house. Now she's at zero. Everything's good. She has her nice house. She can do devotional service. But we lived in a mobile home before, and, you know, she didn't like the mobile home and this, that, and, you know, and she's always like, can we get out of this mobile home? It was always an anxiety for her. It wasn't a house. It wasn't stationary. just need a house. And we tried to buy a mobile home. We actually were negotiating, and she... She said, I can't do it. And I wanted to do it because it was less expensive. So for me, it didn't matter. But for her, it did. So the house was her zero. The mobile home was my zero. Everybody's got a different zero. But once we're at zero, then we're okay. So it's not, you know, zero is just how much sense gratification you need to get so you can stop thinking about sense gratification so you can do devotional service. That's the point. So, so you need enough sense gratification so you can stop thinking about it. That's the point. All right, I got my BMW. I don't think about cars anymore. I got, I've got, I got my MacBook Pro. I, now I've stopped thinking. I'm not online looking at computers and speeds and chips and hard drives. And I got it, and that's it. It's finished. And I do my service. I got what I need. That's it, right? You know. Whatever it is. Now maybe you might say, but what if it's something I shouldn't be doing? Okay. That's something for you to deal with. And if it's something you shouldn't be doing, but you just have to do it, so don't do much of it. Just do it enough that you can you know, eventually stop doing it. That's the idea. Or eventually get over it. Okay, so Deepak has a question. I have to pull this off into a darker place. Okay. Now, you get another view. Speak about trying and with determination you can do it however when to know despite trying with determination is not working so best to quit never quit Deepak you should follow you're from England so you have to follow Winston Churchill okay now we're going to make this 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 uh, video interesting we're going to move move the camera right get a dramatic effect Yes, Deepak. Okay, this is for Deepak. Give him some dramatic. So, Deepak. Um, Winston Churchill's famous speech, never give up, never give up, never give up. So just keep trying. Don't give up because someday you'll success, be successful. Or you have to consider that you tried, but actually you weren't determined. You didn't believe you could do it. You didn't say, okay, that's it. This is what I'm going to do. You didn't cut the knot. Like, here's... Here's the thing you're attached to. Here's, here's you, and here's what you're attached to, right? And there's a, and and you need. You're saying I can't do it. I can't pull. I can't. So you're trying to pull, but you're not willing to just cut it. So, when you're willing to cut it, that's your like. Okay, this is it. This leads to no good. I'm. Re, I'm. I, as this verse said, it leads to no good. I'm repentant. I only want pure devotional service. Then you cut it. That, at that point, when you cut it, it's going to go. And I would say if you're trying, 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 uh, um, either it's physically impossible or you're trying, you have to lower your trying. So instead of being satisfied down here, 
you can't make it all the way to here, then shoot for this, or shoot for this, or shoot for this, because this is too high. Or shoot for this and realize that you haven't actually had the right consciousness to shoot for it. You haven't cut the rope. You haven't said, okay, that's it. It's over. If I don't stop this, this is going to go on the rest of my life. There's a strong impetus to stop something is when we realize if I don't cut this now, it's never going to go away. It's just going to haunt me for my whole life. And if that idea or that emotion goes deep, deep into your heart, it sinks very, very deeply into your heart when you just go, oh my God, that's so true. That this thing which is controlling me, that's got the best of me, if I don't give it up, it's going to tr control me for my whole life. And I need to have certain things in my life that I can never have or never have properly unless I cut this rope. And that settles in, in to you deeply. Then you're trying. Then that's, that's the kind of trying that's going to get you higher or get you more success. Maybe not complete success, but more success. And in your situation, what I would say is that's one thing you need to think of. And the next thing you need to think of is how high can you go? Because like you're a man, you're a young man. And young men, most of them, 90%, 95, 99, 99.9, if they want to be Krishna conscious and stable, should have a stable grihasta ashram. So in your situation, you're not saying, okay, I've tried to be perfectly celibate and I can't do it. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to be perfectly celibate. Most men, most people can't be perfectly celibate. So... But so you're not you're not trying to be perfectly celibate, right? You're just trying to control yourself in a way that you can have a very nice marriage, stable marriage, because stable marriage is very important for controlling sex desire, and it's very important for most people over the long run of their Krishna consciousness that creates stability in their life, because most people need a partner. And when you have a partner, it's just that brings you to zero. And if you don't have a partner, you're not at zero, and you're trying to, to get to zero um, without a partner or get to zero in, in relationships with women or relationships with men that are not consecrated, it doesn't get you to zero. It never gets you to zero. It never satisfies that need. That's the point. You need to be able to satisfy that need in a way that you get to zero. In any kind of relationship which is not stable is not a zero relationship. It's a relationship which is, you know, like, like you have to ask yourself, in any relationship you're in, is this relationship, has it getting me to zero? Is it getting me to zero? Or is it shooting me down to negative 108? Because the relationship, the relationship is meant to get you to a point of not sense gratification. It's get you to a point where you can stop thinking about sense, enough sense gratification to stop thinking about sense gratification so you can think about devotional service. So that go back, goes to Yamini's question. Sense gratification, we engage in sense gratification to the degree that we can stop thinking about. That's the, for a devotee, the point of sense gratification is to stop thinking about sense. So I'm hungry, I eat. Now I stop eating. I need to be married, I get married. So I stop thinking about getting married. I, I have a, a desire to serve Krishna in a certain way and I do that service and that satisfies that need that the physical or emotional or the need that, because of the nature I have or I, ha I have a, a desire I'm, I'm living in the brahmacharya ashram and it's very uh, disorganized or unclean and loud and noisy and I just need to get my own room and I arrange to get my own room in the ashram or I get a place across the street from the temple and now everything's fine. Now I'm back to zero. I, I, was, I was disturbed there. I couldn't, I couldn't focus. I have to write. It was too noisy. I need to go to bed early, get up early. And so now everything's fine. I'm at zero. So whatever, whatever it is we want, it's to get us to zero. It's not to give it. So sense gratification, the idea of sense gratification is so we become, so we don't think about, we get enough that we don't think about it. But if we get sense gratification that makes us think about more sense gratification, then that's, that's the problem. You understand?
So, so you may not be able to be celibate, but I would say that you is like most, the you means most everybody. But the idea of being married is not sense gratification, although Prabhupada says it's a license for sense gratification, but don't misunderstand what he means. It, it, it's just a license. Grihasa life is a license to eat more opulently than a brahmachari. That's all it is. But essentially, it's basically brahmachari life. It's an opulent form of brahmachari life. Instead of living in an ashram, you have your own house. Instead of being entirely celibate, you're basically celibate. It's not an ashram for sense gratification. If you think it's an ashram for sense gratification, then how can you be Krishna conscious if you're engaged in sense gratification? You can't be. It's an ashram to get enough sense gratification that you stop thinking about sense gratification. That's the whole point. Any sense gratification you need, any selfishness, is just to get enough so you stop thinking about it. Right? Like we have like so many young girls, you know, they meet a boy and they think, oh, they get so enamored by it. Well, in Vedic culture, by the time you're eight years old, you'd have your husband. So you wouldn't have to deal with that. You wouldn't get married at eight. Or by the time you're 13. So it's natural to get enamored by it. So your parents get you married when you're 13 or something or get you engaged. So now you, so you're not 13, you're at zero. You don't have to, you know, there's all these boys around and they don't bother you because you have your husband or your husband-to-be. So you need that much sense gratification so you're at to get to zero, so all these boys don't bother you, or in the case of a man, all these girls don't. So you're the man who's getting engaged to the girl at 13. You get engaged at 16. You decide, well, we'll get married when I'm 24. Okay. But until you're 24, you don't have a problem with all these girls because you're engaged. That was the system, which seems archaic to people now, but when we actually analyze it, it's, it's really good. If at a very young age, you just, you have, if you can get someone to zero at a very young age, that's good. Now we have people 35 years old and they're still not at zero. And, you know, how can you afford to not be at zero in this society? Because in this society, you know, this society is permeated with sexual vibration and stimulus. Like everywhere you look, up, down, left, right, you can't escape it. It's everywhere. So how can you afford not to be at zero? Okay, move in the Brahmacharya Ashram. Do that for a couple of years. That will keep you at zero. But when your meter goes below zero when you're in the Brahmacharya Ashram, then you have to get it back to zero, which is by changing your ashram. The whole point is get it to zero. Right? Does that make sense? Just Deepak, just get it to zero. That, make a t-shirt, write that on your wall, put it somewhere, just get it to zero. That's the whole point. So any, anything you do, whether it's a relationship or whatever it is, where sense gratification is involved, you just want to do it to get it to zero. You know, buy, buy the BMW. You're thinking, of, you've been thinking about it for the last three years, and you're spending like every day online for half an hour looking at all the BMW. You know, it's like you could be reading Bhagavatam. Just buy the BMW, and that time you spent surfing the internet, you just read Bhagavatam. You understand? So it's just about getting to zero. It's not about being Superman. And, and so that's your objective, just to get to zero, right? That's your goal, that's your prayer, that's your focus. Well, Krishna, please help me get to zero. Does that make sense? Okay, he has a comment. Thank you, that's too good. If you need someone to mow your lawn, I'll be happy. We just had it mowed yesterday, look at it. And he only, and he only did, he did five acres for 120 which is $60 cheaper than the devotee charges. You know what they say, be careful when you do business with devotees. Okay, but in two weeks it'll be ready to be mowed, so you can fly over here, but we won't be here. But some other devotees will be here. Well, you can come over here next year when I'm here. Maybe when I come through England and you can fly back with me, and then you could mow the lawn. But then we have to buy a mower. And that's like a thousand dollars to buy a mower. But anyway, we can think about it. You can save, okay, here's the plan, Deepak. You save 100 pounds a month. No, you have to save 200 pounds a month because 100 pounds a month will be for the ticket and the other 100 pounds a month, well, 80 pounds a month for the ticket. Yeah. 70 pounds a month for the ticket and 100 pounds a month 
and then you can fly back with me and then when we get back we can buy the mower find a good used one and then you can mow the lawn you can stay as long as you want mowing the lawn then if you really get inspired you can do a garden anyone who wants to come to my property and stay here when I come back next year then uh, we, if you like gardening you can do or landscaping you can just come here and landscape will feed you we'll give you a room and you can come here and landscape and garden to your heart's content Maybe this message is going to go viral, and like every woofer in the world is going to come and show up here next year. Okay. Kunal and Yamini have a question or comment. Your point regarding connecting the selfish need with the advancement of Krishna consciousness was useful. We also liked your point about bringing the personal desire to zero point. So, yeah, so the point is, every, the point, just to make it clear, everyone's zero point is different. So don't, don't lament that your zero point is a BMW when actually it should be a Ford Escort. Anyway, it's a BMW. It's what it is. Oh, my, my zero point should be a Hewlett Packard but your zero point is a MacBook Pro. Anyway, no problem. No, MacBook Pros are good. Get the best for Krishna's service and use it. Use it in Krishna's service. Right now, I have my eyes on a microphone. It's a JZ J1, made in Latvia. And I'm going to go to Latvia in May. And then all I have to do is convince some devotee in Latvia. Oh, find, find that microphone. Maybe we'll find a used one. It's cheaper. And I, because um, I do recording, I do different things, and that that mic is so good, and it's only like four hundred dollars. So, so that I can get the J Z J one, and then I, you know, because I have my zero point is the J Z J one. It's only four hundred. You could spend easily three thousand dollars on better mics. But um, you know, and someone else say, hey, you know, we only need a sixty dollar mic. Samson C01, $60, and that's all you need. Yeah. But my zero point is not the Samson C01, $60. It's the JZ J1, only $399. And I have friends whose zero point will be the German mics, Neumann, U87, $3,000. So, whatever, you know. So you understand that everybody's zero point's different according to what we need. And the needs may be totally in relation to service, not even sense gratitude. This is what I need to do my service. I need this. I need this level of equipment. And I might think, no, you don't. And you say, no, this is what I need. Okay, so you do it. And maybe you work hard and you get the money to do it. And so then it's okay. So don't lament so much about your zero point. And as you advance in Krishna consciousness, naturally you become more renounced. So, you know, like now, those of you who know me, they say, what do you want to eat? I say, kitri and baked vegetables. And then they ask me the next day, what do you want to eat? Oh, kitri and baked vegetables. And then they ask me the next day, what do you want to eat? Kitri and baked And they're like, is that all? And I say, yeah. And I, and I always say, yeah. I couldn't do this when I was 20, but I'm a little older than 20, so now I can do it. So my zero point is, it changes as you advance also. So I can eat more simply. Right? You understand? So, you know, sometimes you just have to deal with your zero point. As long as your zero point is not sinful and your zero point is not, it's not outside the principles of devotional service. So, um, you get to your, you know, like look at Ambarish Prabhu. Ambarish Prabhu, as you know, is an amazing devotee. He's, he's working on, uh, de dedicating his life and energy to building Mayapur. He's given so much money and so much time. Yes, you know that. He's given, he's giving, that's his project. And Prabhupada asked him to help and he's taken this project as the manager and it's not easy. And he always goes to India and he travels around raising money and he's still doing that. And He's the great-grandson of Henry Ford, so he was heir to the Ford fortune, and he's using that in Krishna's service. 
And for him, his, his point zero, and Yamini, your point zero in terms of your standard of living, and Deepak's point zero, and Eddie's point zero, and Kunal's point zero, and, and uh, Guru Nisha's point zero, are all different because of how we're raised. Right? So, Ambarish was way, raised in a very wealthy family, so his point zero is different. I was raised in a fairly wealthy family also. My, you know, so for us in the West, our point zero is different. Most Western Brahmacharis are raised in you know, nice middle class, upper middle class, wealthy families. Even in America, middle class is like upper class in India. So Indian Brahmacharis, most of them, middle class India, it was like, middle class India is like basically like poverty in America. It's just the, the level of austerity of middle class India is like, it's so much more austere than middle class America. We're not used to so much austerity. So the brahmacharis in India, even if they come from middle class, even upper middle class, their lives are more austere. Even upper middle class India is more austere than even most lower class life in America. It's just the way it is. It's not a criticism, it's just an observation. So for Western brahmacharis, our point zero is higher than for Indian brahmacharis. You know, Brahmacharya sleep on the floor, 500 in one room. You know, they're loving it. But, you know, Western Brahmacharya if you know, two or three in one room, okay, you know, that's like, you know, and I got to have the bed with the, you know, the little mat and the, yeah. So, but does it mean that the Indians are better devotees? Not necessarily. It's just the point zero is different. So don't worry so much about your point zero if your point zero is not getting you in trouble. Once you, you get there, it's not a deviation then you're okay. And your point zero is integrated within your nature, your upbringing, your samskaras, like that. And as you advance, your point zero will be different. And also, you have people who are raised in very wealthy families who by nature are extremely austere. So their point zero is, is very low. Now you might say, yeah, let's say low. You know, they're very austere. Even though their family was very, very rich, their nature is, they don't need it. They live very simply. They're very, very happy. So some devotees, so that's their point zero. And they like austerity. If you try to give them a bed, no, I want to sleep on the floor. Try to give them nice opulent present. Can you just give me some, can you just steam some vegetables and put a little ghee on it? That's all I want. That's their nature. So that, you know, that's great. But the real thing is, what do they do and what do we do in those, when we're not eating and sleeping? You know, are we both fully engaged in devotional service? So if we are, then that my, as long as my point, point zero doesn't deviate me from devotional service, then my point zero is just what it is right now, according to the position of life I'm in, and it'll, it'll change as I advance. And, and it may not change as much as that austere brahmacharya. Even when I advance and I'm seven years old, he may have been more austere when he was 16 because that's his nature. Does that make sense? So it's, just, it's like dealing with reality. Okay, oh my God. We went another 47 minutes. You got special bonus. Okay. Um, anyway, these are important points. Good to talk about. And um, let's sign off now. We'll see you tomorrow. Reflect on these things. If you, if you have any questions, then we can... Uh, uh, you can make a note of them, and then you can ask them tomorrow. Okay? So thank you very much. Feel the Prabhupada ki